the real question is, though, Scott, is where are things at right now for Israel? Because the reports are pretty damning. Uh, the Western media even, you have CNN, you have New York Times. They're all coming out and talking about this is the end of the line for Israel. Its operation, also known as the genocide for many people, has reached its limits. Hamas, the resistance, they're still very much in play. And you, we do have this long war now that Israel has entered with the axis of resistance. Regardless of whatever Iran does, whatever Hezbollah does, it's a long war. It's not going to end. Israel has crossed the line. So, Scott, how did we get here and what is the reality? Because I think uh, we are getting caught up in a lot of the, for very good reason, a lot of the bluster of the moment. But what is the reality of this situation for Israel and, of course, for the region as a whole? Well, I mean, I, th I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, Israel's not winning. You know, they're, they're, in fact, I, I personally believe that Israel's been fatally injured by this, that uh, the, the damage that's been done to Israel's reputation by their genocidal behavior towards the people of Gaza is irreversible, that Israel will never recover from this. Um, nor should it, to be honest. Uh, you know, a lot of this damage is, of course, in terms of, you know, the the public relations aspect, but there's a legal aspect of that too, because the International Court of Justice has literally defined Israel as an apartheid state. <laughs> That's a big deal. Um, the International Criminal Court has issued arrest warrants for the Prime Minister of Israel, the military chief of staff, and other individuals for um, for the crime of genocide. Uh, this is a big deal. Uh, you don't walk these findings back. They don't disappear. Um, you don't get to erase that ledger. Uh, the, the, the other issue is economic. Um, the economic damage, I mean, you know, we talk about Hezbollah, we talk about Iran, um, talk about Hamas. Let's talk about the Houthi. They've carried out one of the most successful um, naval blockades in history. Uh, and they don't have a Navy, at least not one of uh, of any note. But uh, what they do have is ballistic missiles and drones and other and cruise missiles um, that are used to target shipping uh, that's seeking to transit the Red Sea, Bab el Mandeb, uh, Gulf of Aden. Maybe that's the other way around. Um, you know, get up to the Suez Canal or get to the you know, southern port of Illit, um, and, and they've shut it down. Uh, the Israelis have had to close the southern port of Illit. Um, it, they're going bankrupt. They're suffering billions of dollars of, uh, of damage. Um, you know, this translates into, you know, poor industrial performance, um, uh, loss of jobs. Now we couple on to that the fact that Hezbollah has pretty much caused Israel to depopulate uh, much of the north of Galilee, um, you know, people had to flee their towns and villages and seek refuge elsewhere. Uh, this is on top of the tens of thousands that had to flee around Gaza. So you have a significant number of homeless in Israel who aren't working because their jobs are, are shut down and uh, Israel has to sustain uh, this. Um, Israel's collapsing economically. Um, before the... Um, the October seventh, uh, you know, raid by uh, by Hamas on Israel. Um, Israel was deeply divided over the issue of Benjamin Netanyahu's effort to um, to you know transform the uh, Israeli judicial system in a manner that would make it impossible to indict him for um, you know very serious charges of corruption. Um, this got to the point where Israeli society was divided to such an extent that the president of Israel warned literally in the weeks leading up to October 7th that Israel is, is dangerously close to a real civil war, to breaking down, that to have Israel's fight, Israelis fighting Israelis. Uh, that problem hasn't gone away. It's still there. But the, the, the main thing is that the world now believes strongly that there must be a Palestinian state. Israel has, had done its best in suppressing that and trying to create the conditions that would never allow a Palestinian state to uh, to reach fruition. And there were many Gulf Arab states that were going along with this, Saudi Arabia, etc., 
who were looking for improved relations, normalized relations with Israel. Um, but, you know, today, that's it. Uh, Israel has lost this fight. The world is committed to the creation of a Palestinian state. Right now, they're talking about a two-state solution. But, you know, here's the thing. In order to get that two-state solution, Israel will have to commit to reversing um, most, if not all, of the settlements on the West Bank. And this will result in the violent objection on the part of Israeli uh, settlers. I call them the Brooklyn Jews uh, who come from America because they know they can get away literally with theft and murder of uh, Palestinian land and uh, Palestinian people. Um, they will rise up. There will be a, a significant level of, uh, of uh, civil unrest uh, resulting from this, um, that we part and parcel of the overall deterioration of Israel as a nation state. Millions of Israelis hold dual citizenship. We already see hundreds of thousands of Israelis fleeing Israel because it's just not a good place to live right now. Um, but what happens when millions leave? What happens when the, uh, the indigenous Jewish population of the Levant um, drops from 9 million to 5 million, drops from 5 million to 3 million? Um, <clears throat> meanwhile, uh, the population of the um, uh, my camera just went out of focus there. I don't know if that's me getting drunk or my camera getting drunk, but uh, <laughs> it looks like yeah, it looks like it's getting you out of focus for some reason. <laughs> uh, there we go. There you go. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> keep it out of focus, Ritter. <laughs> <laughs> it was better blurry. Um, <laughs> so, but the, the 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 point is that um, I lost my uh, lost my train of thought, but. That's that. We'll just leave it at that because I don't know where I was. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I think the point was made about the economic catastrophe that Israel is placing itself in, all the dislocation that now Israel, uh, I guess, unironically, given that it has been the perpetrator of this for so many years, now is uh, finding itself in this very unstable situation and. You mentioned the economic side of it, but it, Scott, it, it it feels like it's compounding because it's it's there's this economic cost that Israel is experiencing, and also there's this always looming, and I don't, I just don't see this ending, this looming reality of Hezbollah of Iran that they, you know, are becoming more and more and more uh, ready and willing to engage with Israel militarily. And Israel continues to push for it. This is what it blows my mind is that they're continuing to push for something that even the Western media is admitting would be a complete disaster for Israel. So what would it actually be like for Israel to engage in a, a, a intensified conflict with uh, forces like Iran, like Hezbollah, which Israel seems to be threatening uh, uh, and and pursuing absolutely egregious crimes, like assassinating major leaders of Hezbollah, for example. What would this mean for Israel? Well, it would mean the physical destruction of Israel. Um, Israel is not in a position to fight Hezbollah in Iran at the same time and prevail. Um, under the best possible conditions in uh, 2022, 2023, uh, without an exhausted army, with the full support of the United States, in exercise conditions, Israel tested uh, whether or not it could take on Hezbollah, take on Iran, and, and, and at the same time, and the answer is no. Today, you know, Israel's been, uh, you know, gutted by what, nearly nine months of war in Gaza. Um, the Israeli military is not, you know, it's not designed to fight for nine straight months. Um, it's run out of spare parts for its tanks, for its armored vehicles. It's run out of ammunition. The personnel are exhausted morally and physically. Um, you know, so Israel is in no position to fight Hezbollah or fight Iran. And the Israeli Defense Force knows this, but Benjamin Netanyahu also knows that 
he can't be the prime minister of Israel uh, if Israel seeks a, a, a ceasefire, that in order to stay on as the leader of Israel, he needs Israel to be in a constant state of conflict. But he has to manage that conflict because you can't provoke a straight up war with Hezbollah and Iran. Uh, that's a war you would lose. What you need to do is manage this conflict to be right below the, the threshold for total war. Um, Iran and, and, and Hezbollah are thinking the same thing. They don't want a full-scale fight with Israel either. Um, you know, Lebanon has been digging out of the uh, consequences of 2006. Um, you know, they, they haven't fully recovered from the last time, you know, Israel bombed Beirut because of an Israeli-Hezbollah conflict. Um, and Hezbollah isn't just simply a resistance movement anymore. It's a, it's a political party, one of the leading political parties uh, in Lebanon that's responsible for the totality of Lebanon. So they're not going to be pushing for a fight with Israel that will destroy the nation that, you know, they claim to be, you know, part of the leadership of. Uh, Iran is not looking for a fight with Israel. Iran's looking to go to Kazan in October and participate in the BRICS conference to be part of this new, you know, Eurasian economic miracle. Um, that's their focus. Uh, you know, Israel understands that neither Hezbollah nor Iran want to see this thing escalate, which is why Israel carried out what I call the perfect provocation. They crossed the red lines of Hezbollah by attacking Beirut. They crossed the red lines of Iran by attacking Iran. But they did it in a very limited way, a very focused way, um, that makes Hezbollah and Iranian retaliation very difficult. Because now, you basically are asking Hezbollah and Iran to throw away everything that they've worked so hard for decades to build. So I think one of the reasons why we see the delay in a response is that both Hezbollah and Iran are looking for, you know, how to strike the balance um, between the need to retaliate. They must retaliate. There will be a retaliation and the necessity of making sure that whatever retaliation takes place is a extraordinarily effective. So that the Israelis understand what happened, but B designed not to promote an Israeli um, response. And that way you can nip this thing in the bud. And here's the most important part. Stay the course on a policy direction that's succeeding. Both Hezbollah and Iran know that the axis of resistance is winning the war against Israel. And that if they can simply stay the course with the focus on Gaza, that Israel will continue to make poor decisions that empower the people of Gaza. You know, Israel said they wanted the total destruction of Hamas, that they'll never sit down with Hamas, never deal with Hamas. Well, Hamas is winning, so Israel is going to have to do that. But how have, you know, how, how, how has the, the Russians and Chinese worked around this? Well, the Russians have, you know, are the ones who initially brought Fatah and Hamas together in Moscow to talk about creating a new political identity that encompasses both. Um, but keeps Hezbollah leadership in place, but they're no longer called, I mean, Hamas leadership in place are no longer called, you know, Hamas. Um, that's, that's already been implemented. Um, you know, China just brought 14 factions together um, in, in, in Beijing, where, you know, they now operate as a singular political front. Um, what's important about this? Hamas dominates all of this, but it's no longer going to be called Hamas. It can be called something else. Uh, so there, remember that jaw, 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 that yak, yak, yak. Well, maybe uh, now there'll be, um, you know, people that are in a position to negotiate uh, to, to yak, 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 who aren't called Hamas. And Israel will have to, uh, will, will, will have to find a way to, uh, uh, to deal with that. The axis of resistance is winning this fight. So why would they want to change a fight that they're winning? Why would they want to go all in on a, on a hand of cards that isn't a guaranteed winner? Um, so I, I, you know, I know there's a lot of people out there who are frustrated, angry at Israel, and are begging for some sort of you know retaliation yeah. to put Israel in its place. Israel's being put in its place now. If you're for Palestine, then you should be for the solution 
that ends with a Palestinian state and a war between Iran and Israel, Hezbollah and Israel, that's not the best path to get to that. Avoiding the escalation of conflict so that the world can confront Israel with the evil that it has done is probably the best path to Palestinian statehood. Yeah. And you said the axis of resistance is winning. We can see that. Maybe your final reactions to this, Scott. We see the report. I mean, this psychological warfare, some are calling it, where Iran and Hezbollah and the entire axis of resistance, they make statements. There's rumors of preparations. Uh, there's talks about whatever happens will happen. It happens on their terms, and it'll happen in a way that is bigger and uh, much more impactful than, let's say, April when Iran responded to Israeli war crimes on the embassy in Damascus. But at the same time, now you see also reports of the United States scrambling of the entirety of the political establishment um, you know, in the West, uh, other than, and, and of course you have Qatar in there, but other than Israel, of course. But the uh, you have them scrambling and almost admitting that Iran and, and the rest of the axis of resistance, they're likely to stand down if the carnage in Gaza ends, if the genocide ends, if it ceases, if it stops. It's almost an admission in my, if how I look at it, whether there's any facts to it or not. It's almost an admission that, as you said, Scott, the axis of resistance is having such an impact doing what they're doing. So uh, your reaction to uh, those reports that we're hearing, where it's almost as if Iran stating and preparing and the rest of the axis of resistance preparing for an escalation with Israel is having is paying dividends already. Well, I mean, first of all, understand that uh, maintaining your uh, forces at a high state of readiness is very expensive um, and you don't get anything out of it because you're ready for an attack that isn't coming, which means you're not engaged in other military activity. You're not contributing to the day to day uh, military mission. You're just simply waiting. Um, the United States is, you know, redeployed naval forces. It's going to cost us, you know, billions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars a day um, in, you know, spinning up naval forces. Uh, in, in a way, Iran and Hezbollah are winning simply by making the United States burn up resources, make Israel burn up resources. But we also can never forget that, um, what Israel did, assassinating these senior leaders, um, you know, crossed a red line, both for Hezbollah and Iran. And if Iran and Hezbollah don't respond, um, they're just opening, leaving open the door for the United States to, or for Israel, I'm sorry, to do it again, to cross this red line, to assassinate people. So regardless of the, um, of the issue of a ceasefire, et cetera, um, I believe that both Hezbollah and Iran need to come up with a, um, a response that will deter Israel from doing this again. And I think that nations like Russia, China um, are directly working to, um, to find an equitable solution that doesn't allow this conflict to, uh, to spit out of control. I think the United States is doing the same thing. Um, whether or not they'll be able to find a, a solution or a formula that's acceptable to Iran, acceptable to Hezbollah, that accomplishes, um, you know, the, the issue of establishing deterrence. Because if Iran de doesn't reestablish the you know, deterrent value of its missile force, uh, Israel's proven that they can reach deep inside Tehran in the most sensitive uh, guest villas guarded by the Iranian intelligence services and and kill somebody. Um, that means that they can knock off senior leadership, uh, senior military leadership, senior civil leadership. Um, this is um, an unsustainable reality for Iran. Um, they have to establish some sort of uh, deterrence-based reality that uh, has Israel saying, oh, yeah, we, uh, we don't want to cross that line right now because we'll pay far greater a price than anything we could possibly gain from it. Um, so there will have to be a retaliation. I just, I think Iran is looking for um, 
you know, something that strikes a balance between punishing Israel and not over provoking Israel. I think Hezbollah is the, the same way. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a hundred percent correct. And, you know, it, 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 it totally strikes back at also, you know, we talked about this in April when it happened, or I believe, no, actually I was in China. This always happens. Actually. I'm always abroad when <laughs> something big like this happens. Uh, but we, when I got back, we spoke on this show about the retaliation from Iran and it was, and you said, Scott, it was meant to establish deterrence that Israel had crossed the red line had killed, uh, top, uh, you know, leaders inside of the IRGC, inside of an embassy, inside of the Iranian embassy in Damascus. And that just has so many different implications and is a literal act of war. And they struck back and it was pretty significant, but it did not establish deterrence. So, uh, Scott, any last words on what exactly would establish deterrence for with Israel? Because it feels like in re- Israel is just a pretty unhinged entity at this point. Well, again, I can't speak on behalf of the Iranian government, and I'm loath to be seen as providing advice to the Iranian government. Um, it's not my job to advise any government um, on targeting and things of that nature. But if we just walk through the problem set, um, Iran, you know, could retaliate in kind. That is to take out a senior Israeli military or, or civil official. Um, that's difficult to pull off and it's unpredictable because you just never know how a reaction is going to be because it's going to, the reaction will be based upon the public outrage over the assassination or the elimination of this individual. Um, I think it's more likely Iran is looking to, they, they have to retaliate in a way that does a couple things. One demonstrates to the Israelis that their air defense system is, is not a guarantee uh, of um, of taking down any missile attack coming out of Iran, and two, um, it has to punish Israel, uh, especially those Israeli assets that would be used to strike Iran in retaliation to an Iranian attack. They have to basically say, um, for instance, we hit this airfield, even though you have it saturated with air defense, we got through. And uh, we we took out you know three F-35s or three F-15s, um, and the signal we're sending you is that we can take out your airfields anytime we want to, uh, in the totality of your aircraft. So let's not do this. Let's not go to war. Um, I, I think you know the. I think Iran's looking to to, to find a target that enables them to reestablish deterrence principles without. Um, creating the need based upon domestic political pressure for Israel to, uh, to retaliate.